to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're visiting, uh, and there's some every week, we've been going through the book of Acts, so let me catch you up. Uh, in Acts chapter 1, Jesus dies, he comes back from the dead, he meets his disciples, he ascends into heaven, he says, go back to Jerusalem and wait. And they wait for the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit comes down on them. Peter stands up to preach, Acts 2, their, people are cut to the heart, people are transformed, these people who have been, who denied Jesus at the end of the Gospels are now preaching, and there's people speaking in tongues, and they say, are you drunk? We're not drunk. That's actually my language that I'm hearing, flames of fire over people's head, mass baptism takes place, and all of a sudden, you have this community of faith meeting in the temple hearing the apostles teach, praying with one another. And then in Acts chapter 3, here comes this massive healing. Peter heals this person along with John, and they use the opportunity just to start preaching. And Peter gets super aggressive. You killed Jesus. You did this. You acted in ignorance. And, you know, some of the, some, sometimes those sermons work, and sometimes they don't. This one worked. People came to faith, and the religious leaders go, we need to shut this down. So they bring him in. By what name have you healed? You know the name. Say it. His name's Jesus. And they say, okay, you need to stop speaking. They say, no. They say, yes, no, yes, no, we're not going to stop. We must obey God rather than man. They threaten them. They release them. Now Peter and John are in a prayer meeting in Acts chapter 4, and the room shakes as they pray, Lord, give us more boldness. They pray Psalm 2, God mocks his enemies. He will not be stopped. So the church then is gathered, wallets have been converted, people are giving money, one guy in particular named Barnabas, and then Acts 5, the anti-Barnabas, Ananias and Sapphira, trying to make a name for themselves on the backs of the poor by fake generosity, and so God doesn't want to deal with that, I mean, God does deal with that, by taking their life, fear falls over the people, and again, the people grow because, hey, man, the apostles are performing signs and wonders. Things are happening. But now this time, the apostles get arrested again. The apostles who are performing signs and wonders now get 39 lashes on their back in public. And their response is, sweet. We've been counted worthy. Now, you would think that would lead to unity, but it actually leads to dissension. In Acts chapter 6, there's a fight over who should administer food to widows and to which group. And so people get appointed. Philip's one, Stephen's one, and then Stephen stands up and he preaches a barn burner of a sermon that gets him killed, killed at the hands of Saul. That's Acts chapter 7. And then everyone begins to spread out bringing the gospel outside of Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria. And we're introduced to Philip. Philip goes to Samaria. Samaritans hear the gospel. Holy Spirit comes down. Kind of su surprising. Then we get this another surprising uh, conversion, this time an Ethiopian eunuch that Philip leads to Christ and baptizes on the side of the road. Then we get to Acts 9, and you've got Saul, who's headed up to kill the Christians in Damascus and arrest them. And instead, he converts and gets baptized by them. He becomes the leader of the, uh, one of the leaders of the New Testament church. He writes 13 of the 27 books. He's kind of an important guy. Acts 10 comes back to Peter. He does a healing in Joppa, he heals a woman, then he heal, or he heals a a man, and then he heals a, a woman. And as he's in, as he's there, he stays at a tanner's house. Acts chapter 11 now, Cornelius has a vision, Peter has a vision. The Gentiles are coming to faith in Christ. You get to the ends of Acts chapter 11, and there's a multi-ethnic church in Antioch at, being led by Barnabas and then by Saul, who's the apostle Paul, who is only leading there because Barnabas has brought him down and he's pastoring the people that he persecuted back in Jerusalem that fled up to Antioch. And now we get to Galatians 2. Why? At the end of Acts 11, verse 29 and 30, it mentions a trip to Jerusalem with these words. The disciples, as each of them was able, decided to provide help for the brothers and sisters in Judea. And as they did, sending their gifts to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. Now, we know what happened on that trip because it's given to us in Galatians chapter 2. So as we go through Acts now, you're going to begin to see me intersperse 
New Testament passages so you can fit all this together. Now, Galatians is written somewhere between Acts 14 and 15. I think it's written before Acts 15 because Paul would have mentioned the Council of Jerusalem in his letter, I think, if, he, if, he, if it had have happened because it would have furthered his kind of argument. So Acts 13, Paul and Barnabas go up on a missionary journey. Actually, they go this way. They go this way from Antioch, and then they go north up into Turkey, and that area is called Galatia. And they had planted churches, and now false teachers had come. And so what Paul is doing in Galatians is recounting the events of Acts 11, 29, and 30 as a way to combat the false teachers. Now, before we go into Galatians 2, let me show you why I think this is the same kind of visit. Now, the majority view for a long time had been that Galatians 2 and Acts 15 were the same event. And now I think the majority view is that Acts 11, 29, and 30 and Galatians 2 are the same event. There are six markers in this text of Galatians. Let me show them to you. Verse 1, 14 years. Verse 1, and Barnabas. There's two. Verse 3, in response to a rev- or verse 2, in response to a revelation. Number 3. Verse 2, a private meeting. Verse 10, remember the poor. And then the six is verse 11, this incident in Antioch, which we won't get to. So I'm going to do each one. Then after 14 years, I went to Jerusalem with Barnabas. Now, I don't want to get bogged down, but let me just show you how hard it is to nail this down. In the first century, they did not do time the same way we do. So let's just say I took a visit in December 2020, and I, got, I went back in January 2022 In the first century, that would be called three years. We would call it 14 months. So this 14 years could be 12 years. That's a problem. Now, we have to date this one of two ways. We either date this as, and I know this is Bible nerd stuff, but I don't care. We're doing it, okay? You can either date this 14 years after his conversion or 14 years after his first visit. In Galatians 1, it says he went to Jerusalem after three years. And in Acts, it tells us Barnabas took Paul down to Jerusalem to meet the leaders. So that's three years. And then he says, and then 14 years I went to Jerusalem, Galatians 2. So is it three years and then 14 years? Or is it three years after his conversion and 14 years after his conversion? Because of the inclusion of how it's written, most people think three years, and then he goes back to his conversion, and 14 years after my conversion, I made my second. So that's reason one, 14 years. Number two, he takes Barnabas. That's the same in Acts 11. The problem is that's the same in Acts 15, so maybe not. Okay, reason three, because of a revelation. That could be Acts 11, Agabus. He comes as a prophet, says there's a famine. And so Peter and Barnabas head down to Jerusalem. The problem with that, though, and you can see how You're just kind of like doing this. The problem with that is that Paul uses the word revelation in Galatians to talk about what Jesus has revealed to him about the gospel. So maybe that's a bad one. I'm still mentioning it. Reason four, this is, I think, for me, the main one. Galatians 2 is a private event. Acts 15, this council, is a public event. So it doesn't make sense that Paul would describe a public event in a private way in Galatians 2. That's four. Five, a call to remember the poor. That's in verse 10. That's the reason why Paul and Barnabas in Acts 11 are traveling, because of the poor, to bring money, to help. And then the sixth one, in Galatians 2.11, there's an incident with Peter, and certainly that could not have happened after Acts 15. So that's the setup. And if you want to, like, go into Bible nerd mode and do a deep study of Scripture, just Google Galatians 2, I mean, Google's not exactly the greatest source of all information, but Galatians 2, verse Acts 15, and you will see article after article after article about which one is right. And here's the anticlimactic point. It doesn't really matter. I just spent five minutes on why it does matter. It doesn't matter because the point of Galatians 2 is still the same no matter where you place it in the timeline. It only matters because this week I stopped and went to Galatians 2 as if it was Acts 11, 29, 30. So to the text, Galatians 2 is about one thing. Is it a must or a may? And Paul is going to argue this in three different ways. What must you do to be a Christian? What may you do to be a, in order to be a Christian? And so you have one, a visual aid, and then two, you have spies, and then three, you have a fist bump. 
And so we're going to do those three. Okay, the visual aid, verse 1 through 3. The issue at stake in Galatians and in what Paul is dealing with is, must the Gentiles be circumcised to be saved? Now, have you ever read the New Testament and wondered, why do we keep talking about circumcision? If you are new to the Christian faith, you haven't read your Bible much maybe, or you're just exploring the Christian faith, it's weird to say it, but this is the issue in the New Testament. Do you find it a little uncomfortable to just start talking about circumcision in public? Do you find it uncomfortable that your kids learn about it from a young age in church? I don't think they're in the coloring books, but I do think that we bring it up regularly. All the parents are like, what in the world? Kids, ask your parents about it. You're welcome, parents. <laughs> Listen, you can't get around this issue. Isn't that weird? Is that uncomfortable? Circumcision is a sign that was given to Abraham 2,000 years before Galatians. It's not some tradition, man-made. It's something that is ingrained into the people of God. In Genesis 17, God says this to Abraham. Abraham, as far as you, you must keep my covenant. That's just an, we'll just call it an agreement. You and your descendants after you for generations to come. This is my covenant with you and your descendants, the covenant you are to keep. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You are to undergo circumcision. It will be a sign of the covenant between you and me. On and on it goes. And if you just think about it and think of the story of the Bible in general, circumcision controls the story. If you look at like the first Passover in Egypt, only people who are circumcised can participate in Passover. It becomes this essential thing that the, as, you know, the, you put blood over the house is, is an expression of salvation uh, for your household, and only the people who can be circumcised can participate. Or you've got Goliath and David, Goliath is mocking God's people. David's in the camp. He's as distressed would be a, a light word for it. And David in 1 Sam, Samuel 17 says these words about Goliath. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he would defy the armies of the living God? Now, why not just say Philistine? Why does he have to put in that? I mean, how did he know to begin with? But let's just say he knew the Philistines then are, are uncircumcised people, and he goes, that uncircumcised person. But as you get, as you read kind of the prophets, you begin to see the prophets begin wrestling with the fact that we've got a lot of circ circ circumcised guys here, but not a lot of people who are following God. What's going on? So they begin to talk about circumcision of the heart. And then as you read kind of uh, what's happening between the time of the Old Testament and the New Testament. One ruler in particular, particular Antiochus Epiphanes IV, he comes into power and he bans circumcision and he murders every child that's been circumcised along with the mothers. What do you think that did for circumcision among the Jewish people? It just raised the bar even higher. And the expectation was that those uncircumcised Gentiles would be kicked out of the land when Messiah came. It's a big deal. It feels uncomfortable, but for them, it was life and death. For them, it was who we are. You can just see, you can understand why the Jewish people had a hard time with what to do with these Gentile believers. And it's not just in Galatians. I mean, chapter 2, chapter 5, chapter 6, circumcision. Romans 2, 3, 4, what's it about? Circumcision. Philippians 3, 3 through 5, circumcision. 1 Corinthians 7, circumcision. Colossians 2 and 3, circumcision. Titus, who's in our text, Titus 1, 10, circumcision. Do you get the point? It's one of the most repeated issues of the New Testament church. I mean, how many sermon series have you heard on circumcision, right? But it's the issue. 
And you may remember a few weeks back, okay, Peter goes into the house of Cornelius. Cornelius, family, the Gentile family, Holy Spirit's poured out. Peter's like, well, I'm baptizing your whole family. So the household gets baptized. He then goes back to Jerusalem. Jerusalem says, how dare you go in a Gentile's house? He says, hey, man, the Holy Spirit came down. What was I supposed to do? And they say, okay, it's cool. It's good. But think about it. The Jerusalem church now, uh, having experienced Pentecost, having James, Peter, and John as their leaders, hearing the story of Cornelius and living it, none of that keeps false teachers out. So what does Paul do? Paul is not messing around. He, he has a private meeting with James, John, and Peter, and he presents to him his gospel, and the false teachers are trying to divide and conquer, and Paul's not really a leader, and he's telling the Galatians, you know, don't be beholden to these people. I'm not beholden to the leaders of Jerusalem. I got my gospel from Jesus. That just tells you how high the tensions are, right? Imagine writing a letter and saying, I'm not beholden to Peter and John and James. I'm, I'm just checking to see if I didn't run in vain. Tensions are high. And so who does he bring? Titus and Barnabas. Now, of course Barnabas is there. Barnabas is always there. Barnabas is the peacemaker. He's the in-between guy. He's the glue guy. He's the guy who introduced Saul to them. He's the one who gave the land. He's the one who's the peacemaker. He's also the one in Galatians 2.11 that makes a major mistake in the name of peacemaking. But who is Titus? He's a nobody. He's not a leader. In fact, at the end of this passage, who gets the right hand of fellowship? Paul and Barnabas. Is Titus mentioned? Nope. Now, he becomes a pretty big deal because in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, 23, he is the one who's the co-worker with Paul who's collecting money. He's the one who gets a letter written to him. Titus, in chapter 1, he's called the beloved son in the faith. Okay, that's in the future. Right now, what is he? An uncircumcised Greek. And Paul brings him in as exhibit A. Hey, guys. Is he a Christian or not? You know, they've heard the story of Cornelius, but here's what I think is happening. It's easy to put your blessing on something that is far away. It's a lot different when it's in your face. I feel like this is true with Christian unity. I'm so unified with Christians that are 100 miles away because I don't know them. It's a whole different thing to be in unity with people you live with with people you know, with people who've made mistakes. And so Paul is dragging in Titus. Guys, does Titus wear the same color uniform as us or not? Imagine you have tickets to a football game here in town on a Saturday, and you have four friends from Missoula who want to come. And they come over to your house before you drive over, and to your surprise, they're wearing the University of Montana team gear. And your tickets are in the student section behind the East End goalpost in row one. Will you take them? What will happen? Will you be blamed? Will you be called a traitor? Will you, will you be separated from them? This is Red Sox fan at Yankee Stadium, Patriots fan at a Bills game, Packers fan at a Vikings game. This is what Paul's doing. It's not perfect, but you get the idea. He's bringing in Titus to the group who's not sure they're on the same team and saying, what about him? The man who's the fruit of my ministry, a visual way. Does he have to be circumcised? Now, if you know the rest of Acts, you know there's an issue here because in Acts 16, Paul circumcises Timothy because of the Jews. What's up with that? He won't do it for Titus. He will do it for Timothy. It's because for Titus, the issue is must Gentile. Timothy's a Jew. Can he be circumcised? May he be circumcised? I mean, bum deal for Timothy. He's an adult. I'm going to circumcise you for the sake of mission to the Jews. And as Paul comes back later in the Acts, 
He, he takes a Nazaritic vow and shaves his head for the sake of mission to the Jews. May he do it? Yes. Must he do it? No. And Paul is willing to go to bat for the must by bringing in Timothy. Just two things from this, which I think are important. Number one is when you're talking about the gospel, you're talking about people and the implications for their life. Doctrine matters. I'm trying to convince you guys of stuff. It's going to shape you no matter what wall you try to put up. I'm shaping your view of God. Titus's view of God and Paul's view of God is being shaped by what is going to happen in that room. To be in that room where all this happened would have been just crazy. Hey, guys, you know, all the leaders of the Jews, Jewish church, and here comes this Gentile who the people in that time thought the Messiah was going to kick out of the land. Paul brings him into the land and into the meeting. Does he have the Holy Spirit or not, guys? And Paul, even for impact on him, I, I, don't, I came here so to know whether I was running in vain or not. That's a weird way to talk about your own ministry, right? Paul's been in ministry, if I got the dates right, 14 years. So after 14 years, he's like, I came down there to make sure that I wasn't fighting against Peter, John, and James. Of course, then he says, not that they mean anything to me. <laughs> you just get Paul. Barnabas would never write this, okay? But Paul would write this. I don't want to fight against the people who knew Jesus personally. I don't want to run in vain. So I brought Titus. It affects people, what we say about God. And then there's a way to deal with Christian controversy. He goes in private. They're trying to do, the false teachers are supposed to do divide and conquer. Paul isn't doing that. And so what does he do? He goes to them privately. Now in Acts 15, it's pretty public. And let's be honest, the letter of Galatians is kind of a public thing. We still have it. Lord, give us wisdom. When to be private, when to be public. When to go to the leaders calmly without trying to go to everyone and whether to go publicly and call them all to the carpet. Look, we, some of you love controversy probably. I don't. Clammy hands, heart beating out of my chest so much that I feel like you could hear it. I hate that feeling. The body doesn't love it, but sometimes it's necessary when the gospel's at stake. Okay, so that's exhibit A, the visual aid, Titus. Okay, the spies, espionage in the early church. That's how I could have titled this sermon. I just didn't want to. False believers have snuck into the church. He sees them as tricking people. He sees them as using deception. It appears they have the divide and conquer strategy in that Paul is late to the party. Paul didn't know Jesus. Paul doesn't really know the apostles. It's not really a true gospel. James, Peter, and John know the gospel, and they require circumcision. Why do we know that's what they're teaching? Because in Acts 15, it tells us certain men came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be circumcised saved. That's the false teaching. In other words, you can know Jesus. You can put your trust in him. You can say the cross paid for your sin, but unless you do the cutting ceremony of the old covenant that was given to Abraham, you're not actually saved. Christ plus an external marker that's what the Galatians are falling into. And Paul says, I mean, the book of Galatians is so different than Paul's letters. All, most of Paul's letters are essentially this. From me, I'm an apostle to you. I love you. Here's some doctrine. Timothy says hi. Close. Okay, that's, that's Paul's letters. This letter is this. I'm Paul. You live in Galatia. What are you doing? 
I can't believe you're abandoning, this is Galatians 1, I can't believe you're abandoning the gospel. If anyone preaches a gospel other than the one I preach, let that person be under God's curse. And when you get to Galatians 2, every commentator says the English is to smooth this over. This is broken syntax. The sentences don't make sense. They're kind of just like, Paul's like, and this, oh, but I'm going to say this. He's mad because of the gospel. And he's recounting this visit in Acts 11, 29, and 30 as a way of combating the false spies. Now, just as a side note, is it interesting that Luke doesn't include this in Acts? It just tells me that there are so many stories that we don't know and that Luke probably thought Acts 15 is enough. And he probably, since he knew Paul and traveled with him, knew Galatians was out there, and he didn't feel like he had to tell it again. But still, more stories. Can't wait to learn them. Okay, Paul calls them spies. He says they infiltrated. Now listen, if you've got a church where Peter, James, and John are your leaders, and you can't stop false teaching, we're not stopping it. It's hard to see. Could be personality, could be history, could be, I don't know, cultural expectations, it could be peacemaking. Whatever the case, the false teaching comes from the mothership, from inside. I mean, every, I don't know, do you talk to Christians, everyone's worried about the culture impacting the church? Forget that nonsense. All the struggles of the church always come from in, every time, not every time, a lot. And the result of their false teaching would be, Paul says, enslavement. Jace. Paul will say it differently in Galatians 2. It would make Christ have no value. That's pretty significant. It's Christ plus nothing equals salvation, or it's nothing. We did not give in to them a moment, he says back to the text, so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. So what do you do with spies? What do you do with people who are trying to add to the gospel? We, should, we did not give in to them for one second. I love Paul. We're not giving in. Boy, what an attitude to have for, as a Christian. When it comes to the gospel, I am not conceding one thing. Don't you add anything to the cross of Christ. And if you do, I will not concede that point. You can concede all sorts of things in the name of Christian freedom, all the, you may do that and may do this and may do that, and you have all sorts of lists. But when you start conceding the must, you've lost the gospel. You've lost it. So that, he says, the gospel might be preserved for you. That is, as a Christian leader, you go to war for the sake of other people against these spies who are adding to the gospel. You know, as a culture, we all add stuff, right? We don't even know what we add to the gospel. We just naturally do it. It's like you have to follow Jesus and believe in him, but I also need to do these things. I mean, even in our testimony sometimes, it's never enough to believe the gospel at the age of six. You also have to do stuff sometimes. You hear that in people's lives. It's like it's just not enough. Like, the cross is not enough. It has to be, people will call it, recommending ourselves to God, getting our lives straightened out. Look, your life will never be straightened out enough. It's the cross plus nothing else, and that's the good news. It's not the cross plus what I can do to prove I am in. That's the anti-Christian gospel. That's what you don't concede to. So... Okay, the fist bump, verse 6 through 10, it's okay. The result of the meeting was that the false teachers desire the divide and conquer is thwarted. And it's not just with anyone, it's James, who has already written the letter of James at this point. It's John, who's going to write the gospel of John. It's Peter, who's the main character in a lot of the gospels and have all of his mistakes for all of church history written. It's not some small people. So Paul starts with, I'm independent of these apostles. Oh, but by the way, they're in agreement with what I'm doing. God does not show favoritism. Who they are makes no difference to me. They added nothing. What that means is they added nothing to my message. They're not forcing the Gentiles to do anything. And so they recognize 
the grace given to Paul and Barnabas, and they say, hey, Peter's work is great, Paul's work is great, everyone's on the same team. Certainly, Peter emphasizes things one way, James emphasizes things one way, John in his gospel emphasizes things one way, Paul emphasizes things one way, but in the end, we're all on team Jesus. And so what would you say now? You've all agreed to this. You've all agreed to the gospel. What is going to be the one addendum to your meeting? Theirs is, remember the poor. Why isn't it things like, go do missions? Uh, Don't tell the Gentiles to be sexually pure. Make sure they're careful with the food that they eat so they don't offend us. Paul, don't forget your Jewish heritage. Why do they go with... Hey, Paul, remember the poor, and Paul go, that's the very thing I wanted to do anyway. That's a weird way to end a meeting about the core message of the faith. Now, we've seen in the book of Acts, there are things that get tied closely to the gospel, like you believe in your baptized, believe in your baptized, believe in your baptized, over and over again. Ouch. But, okay, I mean, I, I hurt myself there, but... Here it's what? This is what the gospel is. Now, remember the poor. Now, the churches in Judea are poor. That's why Barnabas and Paul are down there in the first place. They've taken money from the Gentiles and brought it down to them. But here's what's crazy. So Paul, for the rest of his life, essentially is raising money for the Judean churches. And who is the guy that is going to do a lot of the work? It's, guess who? Titus. In 2 Corinthians 8, he's the one whom Paul sends to the Corinthians to raise the money from the wealthy elite in Corinth so that the Judean churches can survive. So I don't know what Titus felt about being Exhibit A. Can you, I mean, just try to picture being in the room. Hey, Titus, I'm bringing you with. I'm going to put you in the middle of the room in front of an unfriendly crowd. Let's see what happens. Whatever happened, Titus brings them money later. But why the poor? Why the poor? You may remember multiple times in Jesus' ministry, I'll just do the Gospel of Luke, the poor come up over and over again. In Luke 4, for example, quotes Isaiah, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to proclaim good news to the poor. Quoting Isaiah. Luke 14, when you have a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind. You will be blessed because they cannot repay you. Your reward will be in the resurrection of the just. Or Zacchaeus sells half of his possessions. Jesus says, today salvation has come to your house. What is the expression of salvation? Half your money out the door. It's not yours. And then Paul will say to the Corinthians when he's raising support for the Gentile, for, from the Gentiles, you know that for your sake, the Lord Jesus Christ, though he was rich for your sake, he became poor so that you, through his poverty, you might become rich. He takes the blessing of money and he turns it into a spiritual truth and then he puts it on them to give to the Judean churches. What is poverty? Let me give you two definitions from people who are poor. This one's from Moldova. A po- for a poor person, everything is terrible. Illness, humiliation, shame. We are cripples. We are afraid. We depend on everyone. No one needs us. We are garbage that everyone wants to get rid of. Or from Cameroon. The poor have a feelings of powerlessness and an ability to make them or an inabil- and an inability to make themselves heard. What is poverty? Lack of voice, lack of security, shame. And the apostles want Paul to remember this group. Now, certainly, that should have some implications for this church, right? Like if you're gonna define the gospel in the most important one of the most important meetings, Acts 15 would be the other one. And they say, and don't forget the poor, and Paul says, oh yeah, don't you think it has implications for us? I just want you to think about our church and what percentage of the aim of our church is to the poor, how you would define it. We have small groups, we have youth groups, we have adult education, we've got Sunday school classes, we've got counseling, we've got mentoring, we've got marriage ministry. All are good, but just notice that like every American church, the structure is for who? Us. 
us. This is why people call the American church consumers. The church creates programs for the people who are already here. Certainly, there's room for remember the poor. I mean, even think of missions. Where does our work go primarily? The wonderful, important college ministry. It's important. Cut zero of it. But certainly, there is room for good news to the poor. Now, that doesn't mean sell your clothes, get rid of a car, eschew modern technology. That that's, doesn't work. <laughs> But there's something about being around the poor that makes you not forget them. This is why people go on short-term missions trips. They are completely affected by the poor poverty they see. They come home, they sell some stuff, they get rid of some clothes, and about six months later, they're back to where they were. Why? Because when it's not in front of you, you won't remember it. And your essential way of viewing the Christian life is, isn't it a blessing to live in Bozeman? Blessing, blessing, blessing language. I think what they would say is, hey guys, remember the poor. So, you don't turn a may into a must. Paul brings the visual aid. Will Titus be saved if he doesn't go through the process of circumcision? Yes. And may we never say you must. You must comb your hair a certain way. Wear certain clothing, listen to certain music, have you know, a certain Bible study practice, whatever it is, and the car culture is amazing at all these musts, may it never be. The cross, that's it. He confronts the spies. Should we add anything to the gospel? May it never be. It's grace alone, by faith alone, by Christ alone. Why would we want to add to that? Because we love ourselves and we just think we can do it shall we all agree to, to the gospel and forget the poor? May it never be. May we never forget the poor. Let's pray. Lord, may we not be a church that is so into doctrine and boundarying the gospel that we f- do the very thing that these people did not want to see happen, and that was forgetting the poor. So let us put up the boundaries that are real and add nothing to the gospel. And let us out of that never forget the poor. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand as we close our service singing.